Welcome back, Patricia Rati. I'm Jazz Glati to your favorite dental podcast. And today we're covering interceptive orthodontics. Why this topic? Well, actually, I've been a super busy boy and I've got so many episodes recorded, a whole range of awesome topics. And so nowadays I'm pitching it to you guys. Which one do you want next? And on the Facebook group, gosh, it was extremely tight, but you guys just about voted for interceptive orthodontics. And this episode, what it serves to do is to help you, the discerning GDP, to gain some clarity on what you're looking for in our young patients when you're thinking, would this patient benefit from early orthodontics or for interceptive orthodontics, i.e. to intervene in their mixed dentition so that they can benefit and have straighter teeth or a better occlusion for their later years and teenage years. Now, it's important to mention that this episode, it's not been made with any countries or systems in mind per se, i.e. what I mean is, for example, if you're a dentist in the UK listening to this, you might be thinking, okay, this is great knowledge, but how can I implement that in the system where I work, uh, in the country that I'm in with the political system and the public funding that I'm in, etc. Well, that is irrelevant because what I want to pass on to you from this episode is really good knowledge and fundamental orthodontic diagnoses. And then you can have a conversation with an orthodontist or know when you should refer for a second opinion. That's what this is about. So if you're in the US and you're worried about insurance and whatnot, it's all about finding out all these issues. And really, I love the way that our guest, Dr. Amanda Wilson, breaks it down. If you really think about it, the main things we're looking for are any errors in development or any problems, malocclusions that affect the anterior posterior, the vertical and the transverse. If you just look at your growing patient in those three planes and you identify all the things that could be not normal, then you have a basis on which to know when you might consider a referral and when you might not. So this episode is gonna open your mind to these things and you will see your growing patients differently from now on, I hope. The protrusive dental pearl is very relevant to inceptive orthodontics. It's all about impacted canines. Now, we know impacted canines can affect one to 3%, so on average, 2% of all people, which is a lot of, of young people affected by this. And what I would encourage you to do uh, as my pearl, and this is stuff that we should already know, but let, let me expand on it, is to palpate for the adult canine for the permanent canine from age 10 onwards so you put your index fingers you try and find the the upper laterals which have erupted by age 8 obviously and then you go a little bit apical and a little bit distal and you should be able to feel a bulge 5 to 10 millimeter bulge above those lateral sizes and distal to them you should be able to feel that buckly and if you can great write that in your notes but if you can't this then warrants uh, some investigation. For example, uh, an OPG, an OPT radiograph is, a, is, a, is a, usually the first line investigation. And this is all to help us to make sure that we don't miss these cases of ectopic canines, which can go surgical and be more complicated in the future. So in terms of our diagnoses, as a general dentist, we all need to be hot and it's part of our checklist. So my advice to you is make sure that your notes template for when you're treating a young person, when you're examining a young person, make sure your note system has has something that along the lines of canines palpated and then if so were they buccal or were they palatal for example if they're palatal then you're really worried about an impaction obviously but you need to be able to systematically do that for every young patient so from age 10 are you palpating the canines and if so are you recording that in your notes that's a good way to stay out of trouble medico legally going forward because two percent of a large number is a lot of young people so let's not forget these really good practices of palpating for canines so that we can better diagnose and intervene with potentially ectopic canines. I will join you in the outro, guys, but let's join our guest, Dr. Amanda Wilson, on the topic of interceptive orthodontics. This episode is eligible for CPD or a CE certificate by answering the questions of this episode. If you've got the app, if you've got the app on iOS or Android, just answer the questions of this episode. And my team will email you the certificate if you got the questions right, so that you get proof that you listen to this episode and you get a certificate that will count towards your educational quota. So what are you waiting for? Download the app on iOS or Android by searching for Protrusive. And as you're already listening to the episodes, you might as well gain the CPD. Dr. Amanda Wilson, welcome to Protrusive Down Podcast. How are you? Thank you so much. It's an honor, Jazz. I've been listening to your podcast all weekend. I'm super psyched to meet some of your audience and I'm doing well. Amazing. And you got to tell the people listening right now, the Petrucerati, the most beautiful place in the world that you are you are speaking from today uh, and how you ended up there. Because we had a little chat before there. So sure. you're obviously from Hawaii. Uh, tell us more about that. Sure. Um, I think a lot of us go to dental school and I went to University of California, San Francisco for dental school. And I met, I was sitting next to a guy uh, with the last name Wong and my last name's obviously Wilson. 
And that's, we sat alphabetically. So it was me, Wong, Wang, <laughs> Yang, all in one row. And I ended up marrying him. So uh, he brought me back to Hawaii. Um, and it's, it's a really wonderful place to raise children. I have two teenagers now and it's very family oriented, very Asian population. I'm obviously not uh, <laughs> since you're seeing me on video, but um, I love it here so much. It's Honolulu, Hawaii. It's fabulous. It's if I had, if it wasn't 9 p.m., it's 8 a.m. in UK right now, but it's 9 p.m. here in Hawaii. Behind me, I have an incredible view of waterfalls and mountains, but I can't show you. But I did pick some flowers you're from making our garden, us so, so. You're making us, <laughs> us all so, so jealous, honestly. Like, you know, yes. I've got people in Kimaria, like uh, places of the UK, Kimaki. like Stoke and uh, all these places, you know, driving in the miserable weather in the car right now, listening to this and thinking, gosh, I wish I was in Hawaii right now. But uh, no, that's great. Thanks so much for making time for this. Uh, Amanda, just tell us a little bit about yourself. What is your mission statement? What is it that you you do because I think what you do is very empowering but I just want to share that with those listening today absolutely so we all have a different journey right and all of us think we're going to start we're going to be dentists and we're going to have this practice until we retire and that's what I thought and that's what my husband thought he was going to do and um, I listened to a really great podcast about families it's a few podcasts back um, this weekend and I really felt inspired by that and it was a very similar story as what I went through um, since I married my classmate and we both had practices it got really tricky, um, especially when we had kids. Um, every time one was sick, it was like, oh no, which is all the time, right? When you, I think you believe you, you said you have a three-year-old. Big time. It's all. All but, the time. <laughs> so somebody has to be flexible. And we'd always be like pulling up the schedule. Oh, I have 10,000 production. I have 8,000 production. Whoever had less had to close their schedule, right? And it was often me. So <laughs> um, at one point we said, you know what? This is, you know, not working. <laughs> so um Let's, let's do something a little different. He said, why don't you take a couple years off? And I had started kind of a side hustle, um, teaching first with him and then his friends, um, how his dentist, general dentist, how to do orthodontics, mostly aligners and Visalign, which a lot of people are doing now. And it started to grow from there. And so I went full time and I started a company called Straight Smile Solutions six years ago, actually this week, incredible. And full time, wow. I help doctors um, with any ortho cases, not just Invisalign, if aligners, phase one interceptive, braces, if it's ortho, airway, um, I help them. And your orthodontic uh, training, so uh, from speaking to lots of guests on the US, I know you do your uh, undergrad, well this is traditionally what I've learned, and then mm -hmm. dentistry in the US is like a, a postgrad degree that you would do, mm -hmm. uh, and then for orthodontics, what was that involved in terms of further training? It's another three years and another degree, it's, mm -hmm. and it's incredibly expensive, I think you guys are very blessed. I'd say the average dentist gets out with a half million dollars U.S. in loans, close to maybe some close to eight hundred thousand. So um, it's it's such an expensive journey. I went to University of Connecticut for my orthodontic residency, um, and if you go straight, 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 you finish at age twenty nine. So it's pretty it's pretty wow, crazy. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And just just because we we talked a bit about families and stuff, and it's great to extrapolate journey. So when you were in Connecticut, hope I hope I said that correctly. Uh, and then where was your your husband? Did he relocate with you to for your training? Or he how did not. That he work? went to Hawaii to start his practice. Um, yeah, he went back to Hawaii. So when we you know commute, it was a very long distance relationship for three years, and part of the time we were married, but we made it through. So if anyone is listening to this podcast, um, doing something like that, it is doable. Where there's a will, there's a way. It's a reality for you know young aspiring dentists who want to specialize and do further training, whether it's a master's or specialty, mm -hmm. that these things are going to happen whereby you're going to have to be you know, time apart kind of because of the training yeah. uh, pathways uh, uh, will uh, take you to different locations around the world. So uh, just it's nice to share people's experiences in that. So today we're talking about what we call in the UK interceptive orthodontics and what you mm -hmm. have referred in our conversations as phase one. So just, just break that down. Is there a difference between interceptive and phase one and just define the those terms for us? You know, I've always called it phase one interceptive. I use the term synonymously. So either one works for me. Um, I think in the US, it's getting more popular. Unfortunately, our insurance only covers one phase of something. You never get both covered. So you have to pick and choose, right? So it is still difficult for our doctors sometimes to convince affluent families how not a problem, right? But for the average family, they are, it's hard to uh, explain the why behind phase one interceptive treatment. So if in the US, the average family, if they had that phase one orthodontics, interceptive orthodontics to uh, improve the uh, malocclusion at that young age, therefore mm -hmm. later on in life, should they require phase two? And we can discuss later on in terms of what percentage would then benefit uh, and, and end up having phase two, they would not be able to get that covered from their insurance. That's, that, that's how it works, right? 
Unfortunately, yes, that is generally how it works. But I'm going to get you guys so excited and so pumped about it because here's the truth of the matter. First of all, if you are a primary care dentist, there's no reason you cannot do phase one interceptive treatment. It's actually so easy. And I would work on a six to nine year old any day over a teenager. And I personally have teenagers. Six to nine year olds are so <laughs> compliant, so lovely to work with. You know, as long as you get along with the parent, the te- the kid is usually so excited. I for those of you who have video, you might be able to see some of the fun things I have on my desk here. I have glow in the dark expanders. Um, you can get decals and glitter in them. Um, they just have so much fun. You could even have entirely removable appliances if you wanted to. And in the U.S., just to add to it, in most states, and all of our states are slightly different in terms of what you can do and what dentists can do and what dental nurses can do or dental assistants can do, um, hygienists can do. But in most states, everything can be done by the team. The dentist doesn't have to do anything but the treatment plan and supervise. Obviously, you can't just like you know leave the building. You have to, you could be working on a crown mm-hmm. prep or, or placing an implant and your team is, is just right next to you working on the phase one patient. So even if you don't like kids, who cares? <laughs> you know, you're only the brain <laughs> behind it. And I know for my husband, one of the reasons he wanted to learn a lot of ortho and not just Invisalign, well, twofold. Um, number one, he's, he's a little older than me, well, a lot older than me. Um, and um, actually, I was one of the youngest people in the class, and he was the oldest, or oh, second oldest. Uh-huh. But um, in any case, he goes, you know, I don't want to be 70 years old still doing drill and fill. I want to do all specialty work. I want to learn how to do high quality specialty work so that I'm just using my brain. You know, I don't have to use my back and my arms and my fingers. And he loves it, you know. So, but the cool thing about phase one, like I mentioned, first of all, like, you know, your team can do it. You don't have to do it. You just have to understand it because you're the brains. You make the treatment plan. Uh, but also very often when you do phase one treatment, if people aren't familiar with what it is, phase one basically is defined, and this is my definition, as fixing malocclusion, the bite. So we're basically fixing things like transverse, so like narrow jaws. You know, we're widening jaws with expanders. could be fixed or removable. We, if someone had like a small lower jaw, we're going to grow that jaw. Lots of ways you can do that. And now with Invisalign MA, it's a fantastic appliance. You can use Invisalign first with MA. That works really well. You can do, if someone has um, a slightly lower, slightly bigger lower jaw than the upper jaw, most of the time that when it presents in phase one, it's because they are maxillary retrochromatic. It's very easy to jump that bite with a little appliance, with some elastics. It's super, super easy. It's all different ways you can do things. So transverse, AP, and vertical. It's basically those are the three major things we're going to fix, you know, in terms of bite, um, deep bites and open bites, habits, airway. And then lastly, just watching out for impacted canines. If you start to see those in the um, OPG or the panoramic x-ray, you can do some expansion, a little two by four or like a, you know, phase one um, aligner. Really, really, really easy. And get those kids out of trouble. And the added benefit, and I can tell you just from personal experience, I started noticing the more phase one I did in my practice, the less phase two I had in my practice or the less hard phase two. So it just it took something that was just a big mess and you break it into two pieces and tackle the harder stuff when the kids are young, compliant and excited um, and willing to wear fun stuff like this. And then maybe, maybe not, at worst comes the worst, usually all you have is a super easy like light or go aligner treatment later. I mean, you rarely even need to do the full thing and it's definitely something where you could tackle both parts and both could be done by a GP. And that's the cool part. Now I'm going to tell you, I might really upset a couple orthodontists if they're listening and I don't know how many orthodontists listen, but part of the reason I started teaching phase one and pivoting to really wanting to educate as many dentists as possible about phase one is I was at this AAO, American Association of Orthodontics, which is our big orthodontic conference. And I was I was in this meeting room and I was listening to orthodontics and and orthodontists for the most part has always been kind of an old boys network, you know, Um, really single colored, single sex. And I always felt a little bit excluded from the whole crew, but they were telling me you should never do phase one because if you do phase one, the general dentist will keep the phase two because it's too easy. So I, they say when general dentists refer me to phase one, and I've heard this more than once, I just say no that they don't need it, even though they do, because that's only a two to $3,000 treatment plan. And if they wait two years, I know it's going to get significantly worse. And now it's a $6,000 treatment plan that they won't take. And I've heard that more than once. 
it literally blew my mind because I don't think like that. And I was so disgusted, mm-hmm. to be honest. And you guys, I'm speaking just for myself, you know, and this maybe is only a few dentists, but you know, orthodontics has changed a lot in the last 20 years, especially with direct consumer aligners and Invisalign and everything. And it's become much easier and many, many more general dentists are doing it because it's easier and it's fun. So, I mean, our, listen, us orthodontists, especially those of us who were in the previous generation, when I graduated, really Invisalign had just started. It wasn't really a thing. So we were still getting all these referrals, you know, it wasn't a problem, but I mean, we're watching our profession basically change, you know, a lot. So we're grabbing at straws trying to keep those patients, but it just wasn't something I could do. I can't do that. I don't feel right doing that. So I said, you know what, this isn't right. How can I educate as many general dentists as possible? I don't care if they want to do it, not do it. I just want them to understand it. So that way they can, they can educate their patients and say, you, you need this because, because too often a general dentist will just say to the patient, you need this because you're seven. You should just go for a consult. And if you say it like that, the patients don't, and the parents are like, they're busy, right? They, they don't want to go unless there's a reason they need to go. So you guys need to be able to explain the reason, you know, whether you take the case or you refer the case, and then you need to find orthodontists if you're not going to take the case, who will actually do the phase one when it's needed, because that is my biggest pet peeve. I think it all starts, uh, Amanda, with, with the diagnosis. I know you gave the subgroups uh, where it's affected, but mm-hmm. um, let's talk about, you know, one from each scenario, perhaps. So you see uh, a you know, someone between six and nine. What are the mm-hmm. kind of uh, things we're looking out for? So, for example, you mentioned transverse mm-hmm. and you mentioned a, a, a narrow arch. How narrow does it need to be for you to then think, OK, this patient will benefit from expander? Do you need to be uh, completely in like a, a full crossbite mm-hmm. or do they need to be a crossbite tendency? What are the guidelines that you can uh, look at to decide and also what age is a cutoff point and then also just follow on from that you mentioned about communicating mm-hmm. to the parent is it is, is it because it's time sensitive and growth related is that the main message you want to send to the patient uh, to the parent wow you hit a, a bunch of amazing points so let me start backwards and go with that last point so every patient every child has three different ages believe it or not so you know obviously their chronological age i mean um my daughter she's 13 years five months okay that's her birthday but well, we'll go back when she was eight, she only had a few permanent teeth in. So her dental age was much younger than her actual chronological age. There were girls in her class in third grade who had all their permanent teeth in. There were boys in her class that had no permanent teeth. So we all have a dental age. We all have a chronological age. And then we all have a skeletal age. And this is the most critical part. And I know you have a three-year-old. I have teenagers. You probably seen, you probably have lots of cousins and nieces and nephews. Kids are maturing way faster than they ever were. And no one really knows what it is. Is it the milk? Is it the chicken? I don't know what it is. You know, conspiracy theory. But I mean, it's the truth. <laughs> you know, one generation before me, I mean, girls matured at 14, 15, boys matured at 17. Now, you know, my generation, it was 13 and 16. And my daughter's generation, it's 10 for girls on average. It's crazy, crazy early. So there's 10 year olds who may only have a few permanent teeth, but they're skeletally done growing. And this really changes things because we really, really have to do phase one while they're skeletally still growing. And it's a very sensitive topic. It's less, much less sensitive with boys. I have no problems bringing that up, but you really need to understand all those type of growth and how to treatment time. And too often in my practice, when I was practicing full-time, I would get these teenagers coming in, especially these girls who were 12, 13, 14, and they were done, done, done growing. And they needed orthodontic treatment and we weren't able to utilize any of the fun stuff that I could do to grow things. You know, we just basically had a compromised outcome. It looked bad. Mom's not happy. Kid's not happy. And I'm like, I'm so sorry. You should have come for phase one. And they're like, my dentist never told me. And that really, really bothered me. And then we had to take out bicuspids. And I would love, love, love for there to be a completely extraction free, if at all possible, generation of of orthodontics. It's slowly moving in that direction, but I'm so opposed to extractions if we can avoid them. I mean, the most common thing that uh, I, I see is a narrow maxilla. Uh, and what I was taught was ideal age is between eight and 10. And please, you know, let me know what you were using. But that's what I was taught by one orthodontic consultant, but it can vary. Uh, and then it's so important to get that, you know, rapid maxillary expansion mm-hmm. or any sort of uh, expansion. Mm-hmm. You can talk about, you know, slow and rapid and when we might consider sure. that. Once, once I referred these cases and it's a shame because it just highlights some of the issues we have in the UK because of the, the funding mm-hmm. of orthodontics, the fact that we have this national health service, which pretty much covers orthodontics where there is mm-hmm. a need. Uh, and most of the specialists, unfortunately, will wait 
just like you mentioned earlier, mm. for a different reason, mm -hmm. uh, and, until all the permanent teeth are erupted, and then they'll just you know take out uh, bicuspids. So this is a real issue mm. in the UK, and, and I'm a big fan of the mantra of treat adults realistically mm -hmm. and treat uh, children idealistically. Ideally. And I feel as though yeah. the children are yeah. not getting the ideal treatment. Uh, so, so tell us uh, about what, what age are we looking at in terms sure. of either doing the treatment yourself, phase one, or referring for a, a narrow maxilla? And how narrow does it need to be? Yeah, I need to answer your question about that narrow maxilla. So um, I'll go ahead and use this as a demo for those of you who have visuals, but I'll talk you guys through it. So there's a lot of things I look at when I'm deciding whether or not we need to do arch expansion. And that is just so simple, you guys. If you don't want to deal with bands and spacers, that's fine. You can do removable. We've got this really fun one like I had here. It's got glitter. It's, it actually glows in the dark. So if they lose it at night, you know, you can turn off the light and it'll glow. But Basically, many things I'm looking at, I'm just measuring the crowding, you know, first of all, you know, obviously they might only have two to two in on top, but you know, you can kind of visualize and see if you have crowding already on two to two, there's definitely crowding. And just to let you guys know, I will still answer the question, but fun party trick for like, say a two, three or four year old. Let's see if you know the answer to this. How much spacing in your, is ideal in your son per arch? What would you like to see? What, what would you want to see in, a, in ba all baby teeth? Well, you know the answer? Firstly, uh, uh, the way I've been taught is that I like to see some spacing because it's a predictor of less likely to get crowding in the future. If I see Correct. there's no space or definitely if there's any tendency to crowding, then I know my, mm -hmm. my, my, uh, the child will be screwed and uh, more likely in the second edition because there will be crowding. So I don't know the exact uh, answer, but I do like to see spacing. And when I see my, my son's team, I like the fact that he's got uh, some spacing in his lower anteriors and between the canine and the, the first um, uh, deciduous That's molar. Good. I like that. But I don't have a, a numerical answer. Please, please uh, enlighten us. Six millimeters. That's six millimeters. Eight. Wow. If you have six millimeters, you should, if you have six millimeters, no vertical issues, no trans issues, no AP issues, your child may not ever need braces. So that's incredible, right? So what's what we're aiming for? Um, obviously, the part of the reason why kids have crowding is actually a first world problem, believe it or not. I mean, it's partially genetic, but it's also for the most part environmental. It's, you know, we are eating, we're meant to, you know, exclusively breastfeed to age two. Obviously, not many people do that. They're, they're feeding, feeding them baby foods and stuff like that. And then to go straight into eating hard root vegetables, meat off bones, you know, very primitive, you know, paleo diet. And obviously, most people aren't doing that. Well, some people in California are. But, <laughs> you know, not, when you're not using your jaw and you're eating soft foods and you're feeding your child on a spoon, they're not using their, their muscles of mastication, which doesn't develop their bone structure correctly. And of course, also a lot of there's tongue tie and tongue not going up on the roof of the mouth and tongue position and habits. So a lot of these things can affect the, the growth of the jaw, not only transversely, like we talked about, but also, you know, AP direction, growing the lower jaw. So... We talked about um, looking for evidence of crowding. We want to see, you know, spacing ideally is what we want to see in that kind of two to two stage when they're like that. I also like to look at the OPG or the x-ray and see if there's impacted canines or tipped canines. That's a sign that I know we need it. I like to look at the anatomy of the palate and see if it's vaulted. I don't want to see a vaulted steep palate. I want to see a nice, you know, broad, sh shallow palate. And one of the fun party tricks I learned also is you can measure... It's just one of the additional things I do. I measure from the mesial palatal cusp tip of the sixes, okay? From mesial palatal cusp tip to mesial palatal cusp tip of the sixes, and you want it to be at least 40 millimeters. Now, of course, in a child with tiny little teeth, it might be a little bit less, and a child with gigantic teeth is going to be a little bit bigger. So that's a rough estimate. But if we're seeing 37, 36, 35, 34, that's a yes. You definitely need expansion. If you're seeing 43, 44. Probably no, not needed. Of course, if the molars are rolled in, it's a little bit different. But I mean, all you take into account all these different things. And then, you know, if I hit, you know, one, two or three of those indicators, we're probably going to go ahead and benefit. I mean, obviously, you're looking at the crossbite in the back, too. If you see a crossbite, you know, that's another reason. Um, if I see any crossbite, remember that. What about if it's a crossbite to... tendency? So instead of the lower mm -hmm. molar um, buckle cusps, being in the fossa of the upper, what mm -hmm. if it's like a, a tendency so that the, the the way that they're occluding is not cus to fossa, it's almost cus to cus, but to how how much of a degree should uh, should we accept that, okay, this is going to be okay and things will, will bed in, or what's the threshold? So I'd probably look at all these other indicators I talked about, and if I had one of those other indicators, then I'd probably do it. If not, I feel pretty confident I could just get it with some braces, some wires, or some aligners. 
But I mean, there's also airway benefits and we got the whole other thing there. You know, I like to do an airway screening, um, looking for evidence of snoring, um, mouth breathing, things like that. So that would be another indication that I might want to do it. So you, can, you can't do anything wrong by expanding. You can always just expand a little. You don't have to full on expand. And to answer your question about rapid versus slow, I learned rapid in school, but when I started teaching my GPs, I switched to slow only because I've seen some very scary things happen <laughs> with rapid expansion. I, one story, I had one patient that and in California, I worked with a more lower middle-class um, population in the Valley, a lot of farm workers, um, a lot of migrant workers that would pick strawberries and things. And sometimes the kids would disappear and go to Mexico or go to South America for a few months. So we had put a expander in a patient and we had told them, you know, do X amount of turns. I'll see you in two weeks. Well, they disappeared and we never, we couldn't get a hold of them. Well, they kept turning, they kept turning, they kept turning. And basically this child had a full on scissor bite on both sides. I mean, like the whole mouth basically collapsed and it was like, I mean, we ended up getting it back, um, but it was so scary. You know? and, and a huge diastema so, as well, because that's one oh, of things that course, maybe GPs course. need to appreciate just, is that when you do yeah. the maximum expansion, it's so rapidly, mm -hmm. you, you're expecting to see a diastema, correct me if I'm wrong. Correct, correct. And that's one of the benefits of slow is that you actually won't see that because they'll slowly start to fill in and they don't freak out as much. But yeah, you can totally do rapid. Um, obviously, that works better with fixed than removable. Um, you can do slow. To me, they both work exactly the same. Um, slow is a little less discomfort, a little less risk, happens a little more gradually. You don't get that really ugly big gap, but it does, does take a little more time. But you know, I do have, I want to let your, your listeners know that I made Fun fact, especially during COVID, I made over 6,500 how-to videos on basically every topic that's out there for ortho. And I try to explain it as 6,500. Yes, that's, sir. You're 6, the most productive woman on earth. That is, it's nuts how many I have. Um, there, and, and literally I've created playlists. So there's one, there's a phase one playlist. Last I checked, I had 166 videos. So there's literally something on every type of appliance, basically. Only thing I don't really get into is like jaw surgeries, because I don't think GPs should be doing that. Tads, I don't think GPs should be doing. And, you know, that's not the fun stuff. That's the yucky stuff. So I try to make ortho clean and fun and bloodless and shotless. But yeah, I mean, people are welcome to take a look at my YouTube channel, which is Straight Smile Solutions. It's free and everything's on. It's just like completely free orthodontic education. So um, the more I can get out there, the, I think the healthier kids are going to be. And that's my ultimate goal. It, it, it's, it's sounding like Netflix for orthodontics. So we'll definitely uh, be Basically. able to share that in the, in the show notes because it sounds uh, very, very comprehensive. That's amazing. Uh, the other common scenario, which I think the UK dentists do get more of or get more done is what, you know, the expansion issue can be tough, but the whole uh, functional appliance, I feel as though in the UK, we are more forward thinking when it comes to the use of functional appliances. You are. Where does that lie in terms of your preference for treatment and what ages are we looking for with someone who's got a large overjet to bring their mm -hmm. uh, mandible forward? So what, what kind of the guidelines we're looking for in that scenario? Pretty much same ages. I mean, I want to get started as early as possible. You're also going to get more compliance the early as possible. So according to some of the literature, it says to wait till pu pubertal growth spurt, but I've had just as much luck doing it earlier, you know, at six, seven, and eight. And now with Invisalign with MA, it makes it so easy. I actually have one of those aligners here, just, just a little ramp that's built onto the Invisalign. So just, just to really uh, break it down for those listening and watching, for those who haven't heard of it. So Invisalign MA, MA stands for mandibular advancement. Yes. And so Correct. what age can you use Invisalign MA? Well, in the US, we have it um, built in, baked into two different systems. One's called Invisalign First. You can start that as young. They require you to have the sixes in, and they require you to have, for the most part, two to two in, eh, at least six anterior teeth, I think is the rule. And then you have to have, you have to be in kind of that intermediate transition where you haven't lost the back teeth yet because it needs retention. So, you know, kind of in that six to eight incisors, and six is in is when you can do Invisalign first. And the lab fee is not bad on that. To be, to be honest, you can get the same outcome with just a twin block or a bionator, which is a functional appliance like you referenced. And the lab fee on that is only going to be like $100 US as opposed to $1,200 US. So I'm all, I'm all up for that, mm -hmm. you know, and then they can have fun and they can bling it out with colors and glitter. Very good. Uh, and in terms of what do you do when you're too late in terms of you see a child and they're, they've missed the growth in, in terms of, you know, the news you give their parents is you just have to wait till phase, well, what, what would have been phase two, but now it's going to be their phase one. And essentially they're more likely to then need extractions. And that's generally the, the main theme of this conversation is that the, the benefits of phase one mm -hmm. is that it may make a simpler treatment plan later on and also one that can mm -hmm. prevent extractions, right? 
That is totally true. And I mean, I'm just going to tell you my own opinion, and there's almost no research on this, but um, I do follow two of your really good bloggers or podcast hosts. Um, one of them is John Mew, who's in um, the UK. He's pretty incredible. I know he's a little controversial, but he's fabulous. I think he's fabulous. I'd love to meet him someday. The other one is Kevin O'Brien. He's incredible at breaking down research. And I believe he has some blogs just on that topic. But um, I do know there's a lot of really anti-extraction people that are out there. And I'm definitely one of them. Listen, I'm telling you from my experience, and this is just my personal opinion from what I've seen. I feel like the orthodontic community is afraid to do research on this because we're afraid to get the answer. But I definitely think there's a correlation between extractions and OSA. I, I've seen it. I see it with my own eyes. My husband sees it with his own eyes. We believe that. So anything we can do, and not to mention they, they look terrible. They look sunken in as they get older. You know, adult patients come in and cry that they had four buys taken out or two buys taken out. And they felt like they were never given a choice. They were never given an option. And it, they feel like it's ruining their lives and their health. So if there's anything I can do to stop that in a new generation of kids, I want to do it. Very good. And then that's a very noble sort of um, mission. I think the more we educate ourselves, uh, the, the better equipped we are to have those conversations with parents, either treating it ourselves, uh, getting the training that's required, or referring it to someone, a local specialist, mm -hmm. to have a good relationship with them. Uh, it's, it's a really important thing. So let's just s summarize some of these uh, diagnoses that we can make as a GDP. So mm -hmm. you mentioned uh, about the crossbite. So the narrow maxilla, watch out for the narrow maxilla, watch out mm -hmm. for the increased overjet. What about deep bites? Is there a role for phase one therapy for deep bites? And if so, what does that look like? Definitely, definitely. And I have all my toys here. So um, one of the, there's a couple different ways you can fix it. And anytime you have a deep bite, you need to find out, is my deep bite due to over eruption of the incisors, be it the uppers or the lowers? And you can kind of, I mean, the CEF is the gold standard for this diagnosis, obviously. And I don't want you guys to be afraid of cephalometric or lateral cephalometric x-rays. They're actually really, really easy to understand if you can get one. And I'm, I'd be glad to give any of your listeners um, a free handout on trying to understand them. But in any case, um, you, things you can do just without taking that CEF, because I know that that's, that's a lot to do, is just Get the child to smile. Look at, um, obviously, you might see a deep bite. And a deep bite, obviously, is we, when the ideal for vertical is when the child bites down, we want to see at least half of their lower incisors. You know, the, the upper incisors should not completely encompass um, the lower incisors. And definitely, they shouldn't be hitting up on the roof of their mouth and causing trauma. Real quick, fun story. Other people may have heard. I had straight teeth, but a deep bite. That was the only malocclusion I had. Um, and... My parents, you know, really couldn't afford treatment at the time. And no one ever told them I needed treatment because my teeth were straight. I just had a deep bite, right? So, you know, I went mm -hmm. on through high school. And then later, one of our, you know, dentists finally said, she has a really deep bite. She's causing trauma on the roof of her mouth. Well, my top front permanent teeth were all damaged from Frematis. I had no roots left. I had completely busted up those teeth. Wow. And permanently, I have literally have no roots on my front teeth. It, they're just crowns. And they're still there. I was told I was going to lose them when I was 20, wow. but they're not. But I just can't eat. I can't bite into apples or corn on the cob or bagels. So it's like terrible, right? Wow. But if I had been treated properly in phase one, I would not have what I have now, which is a really big life changing, you know, you have to really alter things in your life. So yeah, so you have to see if there's, check the smile line. If you see a really gummy smile, you're probably going to need absolute intrusion of the incisors, which isn't hard. You can do some braces. You can do it with, you know, just some aligners to push them up. There's lots of things you can do. Or if sometimes it's um, relative just having a very low jaw angle, um, we call that brachiocephalic. And you can do something called a fixed bite plate, um, or it can even be baked into the aligners. And it's, it's basically just a thick thing that they bite on. And again, you can make colors and glitter and go in the dark. And it's just, you know, two bands, almost like a space maintainer. Um, lab makes it. You just put it in and they wear it for about four to eight months and it props the bite open in the back so their back teeth can't touch and you know teeth always want to touch so if they're not touching they're going to super erupt a little bit and then that helps to open the bite in the back and usually it's a combination of both that you do but it's really not that hard and it really does need to be fixed and it's much easier to fix in kids than in adults. And what percentage of these patients that have phase one therapy mm -hmm. go on to need or want, because they're two different things, I, I suppose, uh, need or want phase two? So I usually end my phase one, and that, that's a great question. For me, and uh, everyone's a little bit different, phase one is defined, ended for me, once the bite is fixed. And if we needed to throw some braces or do some, you know, express aligners on the front teeth to 
for either cosmetic reasons or for functional reasons, like if there were impacted canines and we wanted to consolidate the space to give them more of a chance to erupt, or if we had anterior crossbite, then we would do some type of braces on that. Otherwise, it's just fixing the bite. So I'm done with phase one when two to two are straight, you know, if needed, and um, the bite is fixed. So if we have, you know, perfect bite, no overjet, no negative overjet, no vertical issues, no open bite, no deep bite, and no transverse issues. So we got to hit it all in all planes of space. So if you do phase one properly and you've done all that and, you know, we're basically waiting for 16 more teeth to come in, right? We're waiting for threes, fours, fives, three, fours, fives, and all four quadrants and sevens. I'm not going to count eights because they're not that important, um, which is 16 more teeth. So usually if you give the teeth room to come in and you, you know, get, get rid of all the vertical issues and transverse issues, usually they come in pretty darn straight, you know, can't always. I mean, with my two kids, I did phase one on both of them. My older son didn't need phase two at all. Literally, he looks like he had braces, never had any braces, never had any aligners. I think upper left two is rotated like three degrees. Like I can see it with my eyes, you know, he goes, mom, no one sees this but you. <laughs> But I mean, I say, well, let's just do some Invisalign Express. Let me make it perfect. You know, the girls are going to like it. And he says, nope, not interested. Too busy. <laughs> so, but I just did phase one. And, and if you, you, people think, oh, well, maybe he didn't need it. Dude, he, he had 100% deep bite and five millimeters over jet. He needed it. So, um, you know, we took care of it at a young age and he's good. Whereas my daughter, you know, couldn't control it. She ended up with an impacted canine still. But I kind of knew that that might happen. It was really bad when I took the OPG at, at age eight. So we did have to do a ligation and exposure in phase two, um, which she's not too thrilled about. But, you know, it would have been so much worse if we hadn't done phase one. So at least we didn't have to do two. <laughs> so, you know, trying mm -hmm. to be positive. But, you know, that's worst case scenario, what happened to her and best case scenario, what happened to him. And, you know, can't, can't predict, but all you can do is have the odds more in your favor. What do you tell the parents, though? Like, do you give them a percentage chance? Um, I think impacted canines can be quite tricky, but when it comes to, mm -hmm. you know, deep bites, uh, crowding, large overjet, what do you say to parents in terms of, because they might ask, okay, if, if I have phase one now, I may be paying a lot more in the future if my child needs a, a phase two. So what do you, how do you pitch it to the parents? Yeah, I mean, well, we tell them that we're taking something that's very long and hard, that's about two years, which, you know, your traditional comprehension is, comprehensive treatment is, uh, when the child is really, really busy, I mean, 13, 14, 15, 16 year olds are busy, busy, busy and busier than ever. They're doing sports. They have their studies they, and they don't want to wear things. It's an awkward time. It's a terrible time to have braces. I mean, we all went through it and it was, I mean, I did later, finally later in high school when I got my braces, it was a rite of passage, but it doesn't have to be. Why? I mean, I look at my daughter with Invisalign now and she's gorgeous, to be honest, as a 13 year old. And then you, she looks at the picture of me when I was 13 and she's like, ew. <laughs> You're so awkward, you know, <laughs> but I mean, why not take away that, you know, and let them be more, have more self-confidence and, you know, and plus it's less busy for the parents. They're, they're just, they're already so busy mm -hmm. anyways. Why have to go to the dentist every month? It's a hassle. But yeah, mm -hmm. to answer your question, I can't promise. All I can do is promise you that it's going to be easier and shorter. That's all I can promise you. And occasionally it's not needed. Need is an, it is an air quotes because I mean, like I said, my son still has a rotated number upper left too. Well, is it needed? No, not at all. It's completely cosmetic. So um, certain percentage, definitely. We'd have more of an idea after phase one was finished. Um, but I mean, thing about transverse is if you correct it, it doesn't relapse. Vertical, if you correct it, it doesn't relapse. AP, if you correct it, the only thing that could possibly get worse, an overjet won't get worse, but a negative overjet could get worse. So if you were class three, you can have a late jaw growth. So that is one thing mm -hmm. I can't control the growth. I mean, you might get that in a boy. If they were class three, it's possible. But hey, if I can stop you from having jaw surgery, you know, at 50,000, 100,000 US dollars, you know, no one wants to put give their kid a surgery. So I think I feel pretty mm -hmm. confident you won't have to do this jaw surgery, most likely. Uh, before I share with you a sad story, actually, I'm gonna, um, just completely off script. I just thought of something I want to show you. We get your opinion. Very interesting. While I'm finding the photos, essentially, I'm going to show you a photo of an eight year old child that I referred to a specialist uh, because I thought this kid definitely needs 
intervention phase one ASAP. Uh, and what happened? And I and I and I told Mum. I said, Mum, look, I really think there's an issue here. I think it'd be wonderful if we can ex get some expansion here. Uh, and then the orthodontist had a completely different opinion. Uh, and the orthodontist um, belittled me as as the there's a lowly GDP uh, and mm -hmm. and and said that you know I'm a specialist. He doesn't know what he's talking about. We're going to wait until Ooh. this kid is 13, 14, and then we'll do it. Now I'll show you these photos, and maybe you'll think, yeah. you know what, Jazz? Maybe he had a point, and and you know, I'd, I'd love to get your opinion. But oh, while I'm finding this it. photo, I'm gonna, I'm mm -hmm. I'm gonna switch gears, and while I'm finding this photo, I just want to answer a very good question that I think will help uh, the GDPs listening. Is that once you finish phase one, what kind of retention protocols are we looking for that young right. patient? Uh, so what kind of retention will they be having? Is it always gonna be a hawley because uh, the, the acrylic allows you to maintain that expansion, uh, or can um, Essex star retainers uh, work well to prevent relapse of expansion? Uh, I'd love to hear hear that while I find the photos. Sure, sure, sure. And I'll be glad to talk about why you look for your photos. So I think it really depends on what you did. So after I expand or do transverse expansion, I leave that expander in for a good three to six months. So it doesn't relapse. So I'm not worried about that. Um, same thing I said, overjet correction doesn't relapse. So um, the only thing that you really have to retain would be if you decided to retain like two to two alignment, if you did end up doing some braces or aligners, that's a good idea to retain that. I do one of, well, mostly one of two different things. Um, one would be a bonded retainer that you can just slap on. It's not going to be on forever. It's only going to be on for a few years. So it doesn't have to be pretty and you probably don't even have to send it out. Just use like, you know, braided wire or one of those flat braided wires and put a couple of drops of composite on and it's really easy, the floss technique. Um, but if you don't like to do that kind of stuff, um, you can also order it from any orthodontic lab and it usually comes in a jig or a matrix and then you just drop it on, you know, etch prime bond, drop it in. So easy. You can do that. Or you can, with the Essex kind, obviously you can't do a regular Essex because the teeth, we've got, like we said, we've got 12 to 16 more teeth coming in, right? So that's not going to fit because you constantly have to remake it. But you can make something called a throw. And a throw is a modified Essex where they basically scoop out some of the areas so that um, they can still come in. So you can look it up, T-H-E-R-O-U-X, I think. Tricky to make in-house, but there's plenty of labs that will make them. But yeah, you can do that. Some people also do like um, some of these myofunctional functional trainers. They use these for retention. Um, they work pretty well too. Because I mean, if they're it's usually already straight, um, they usually don't relapse that much. So, um, but yeah, that's that's pretty. Obviously, you can do Nance. You can do lingual hearts on the lower just to maintain molars if you want to work on that. But for the most part, it's not usually a huge and, deal. Com and compliance is, uh, is is good. Compliance usually with these uh, I kids. I mean, do you see much uh, relapse? No. Yeah. Uh, no. Uh -uh. Mm -hmm. No. I mean, these kids that are, you know, six to ten, they want to be there. They're excited to be there. They're stoked to be there. I mean, with a few exceptions, you know, it really is the parent that I, I pick the parent to partner with. If I have a good parent that's excited to be there and a kid that's psyched to be there. And, you, you know, it's all in how you talk. It's not like, oh, no, you need braces. It's like, Oh, you're mm -hmm. going to get braces. What color are you going to get? Or, you know, we're going to do an expander and we're going to do a removal one. Want to see my color chart? You want to see, you can put your favorite team on there and decals and they're like so excited. So, and, and another fun, fun story. Um, when I was in third grade, I wanted a retainer so badly that I actually made one out of candies, taffy candies, hard taffy candies. We call now and laters and paper clips. And I wore it to school. And I guess I did such a good job that the teacher mentioned to my mom at conference um, oh, wow. Amanda's doing such a good job with her retainer. And mom's like, huh, she don't have a retainer. So that that was the sign that I was probably meant to be an orthodontist. But I never got one. But Definitely. I wanted one. It was, your, it was your calling. It was your calling. It was. That was the coolest kids were the ones that had headgears and retainers. Very cool. <laughs> Excellent. Do you want me to tell your readers about what the little gift we have for them? Their yes. Listeners? Um, if you tell them about the the, the handout, the different um, the, the purpose yeah. of the handout and how it's going to help them to to get these diagnoses and points as a checklist, because I'm a huge fan of checklists. Mm -hmm. Please tell them, and we'll link it in the show notes. Mm -hmm. And when our intro and outro, I'll give them the URL to go to, uh, so they can get that PDF downloaded. Great. Yes. And I'm going to give everyone who's listening a copy of a form called um, that I created called My Phase One Smile. And I'm actually holding it up right now. It's a two pager, but it's actually an interactive PDF. So you can, um, it's going to ask you questions and you're going to check them and points are going to be assigned and, you know, different questions about malocclusion and habits, overjet. And, you know, you'll need like a little, either a bully gauge or a period probe to do the measurements. Cause obviously my eyeballs can measure things very quickly without a gauge, but you're going to need that. But that's pretty much all you need. And you will need an OPG or pano x-ray. Because um, there are some questions about um, canine infections, 
um, and angles and things like that, but it's really not that hard. And it's going to spit out a score for you somewhere between zero and 80. Um, and it's going to, if the lower the score, if they're less than 20 points, they probably don't need phase one treatment. I recommend that you keep them on six month eval. Um, if they're 20 to 40 points, um, it's strongly recommended that either you do it in house or you refer, find an orthodontist to do it. And if it's more than 40 points, it's an emergency. So that's really, really bad. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I love it is because it actually gives, uh, quantifies and qualifies and gives us an actual score. And it's something tangible that can be either taken to the orthodontist, you know, and now the orthodontist can't say anything if you refer, because they obviously see that the patients, the parents know what the issues are. Um, or, I, I, you know, I, wish, I wish I had that when I referred that patient, I'm going to find the photos for it. I wish I exactly. had that. Exactly. And we could even fill this out for your, for your patient if we wanted to and give them a score. That would probably be the mm. best thing. If, well, you may not have the OPG, so we probably won't be able to do it. But um, well, I, I do. In I've any got the, case, I, I found the OPG no, actually. No way. But I don't awesome. Let's do it. Okay. So I'll show you that as I'll well. I'll try to do uh, it with my good. eyeballs yeah. the best I can. Um, it's easier when okay. the patient is in the chair because then you can actually measure them. But yeah, it'll spit out a score. And I feel like sometimes all of a sudden, you know, the mom comes in, but the dad doesn't. And then the dad says, well, do they really need it? And then the mom's like, God, I forgot what the orthodontist said. So now they have this handout and they can come home and, and literally show it. Look, they got this score. That's a bad score. That we got to do it, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, mm -hmm. I'm, it took me years to develop this, but it's basically, I mean, as you're more, the more phase one you do, the more you understand it. But initially it's like, oh my goodness, there's so many things I have to look at. What did I, did I forget anything? This way you just go step by step and you'll make sure you hit all the main points, you know, and, and you'll feel very confident with your phase one screening. And it's so easy. Literally your dental nurse can do it. Your front desk can do it. It's really, really easy. So um, anyone in your team, I want your whole team to be screening every kiddo in the practice, you know, so we're not missing anyone. Amazing. Okay. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay. okay. I mean, <laughs> look at this. Sorry. Let's do it. Let's let's work. Walk through. It's going to take me five minutes to go through this. Is that okay? If we go through this? this yeah, patient? of course, of 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 course, okay, of course. Uh, and we can go through it. And and I know Mum's really cool, and she will, she she will give consent for uh, you know retrospectively. And we won't publish it, obviously, if she doesn't. Uh, but to have a look at this. So I've only got uh, okay. these two photos. That was a different patient. These two photos, and then I've got okay. the the OPG as well. So let me know what, okay. what, what well, you want to we'll see. We'll just estimate. But you'll probably remember stuff. So I might, I'm going to ask you some questions, but let me know when we're yes, ready to go. Sure. All right, guys. So we're going to go over Dr. one of Dr. Jazz's patients um, that he mentioned. And we're actually going to run through this My Phase One Smile Index. And I'm going to take you through point by point, And we're going to give this patient a score. Now, normally when you do this, it's, it's an interactive PDF. So it's going to calculate the score for you. I've got a printout. So I'm going to try to make sure my math is good at 10 o'clock at night. Okay. So um, first of all, how old is your patient? Uh, at this point, he was uh, eight and a half. Oh, okay, eight, okay, good to know. Um, there's no points for that, but just a question. So I have an idea of what to expect. Okay, so the first question is, um, is either the child or the parent embarrassed about their teeth? This is the psychosocial part. Uh, I think the, the, the mum was very uh, forward thinking, saying, that I, I don't want my child to have the same issues that I had for my teeth. Uh, and then the child also was interested as well. Okay, great. So that's two points. Um, is the child having trouble closing his lips over his teeth or are there any oral habits that you know of like thumb sucking, passy sucking, anything like that? No, no. there were yeah, no so habits. That's, nope, that's a zero. If the child is an all primary dentition, please answer this question. Otherwise, skip this question. Okay, skip. If the child's a mixed dentition, which we are, please answer this question. Um, does the child have crowding present? Um, I would say yep. yes, definitely. I yes, would say that. Yeah, so mm -hmm, definitely on mm -hmm. permanent teeth. So that's two points. Is there a presence of a constricted maxilla? And that's where we're going to go to your maxillary arch picture that I saw real quick. I mean, obviously, I'm sure there is. But yes, mm -hmm. that's definitely a constricted maxilla. And we talked about the, the trick from six to six, although it's pretty funny because on this constriction, it's, this is a V-shaped maxilla. Um, sometimes we have U-shaped constricted. This is V-shaped constricted. So the molars might measure at 40 millimeters. It's possible, but it's clearly constricted and vaulted 100%, especially towards the front. So um, yes, I would call that a yes. constricted maxilla. So that's going to get two points. Okay. Um, is there overjet? Um, there is not overjet, but we have negative overjet, which gets points. Um, but the other question is, is there open bite? Sorry, is there overbite? And that would be no, it's almost edge to edge. So that's a zero. Um, is there anterior crossbite or negative overjet? The answer is yes. And so we go from the furthest, most deflected one, which would be upper left two. And it says how many millimeters of negative overjet? So if you had to estimate from, you know, the cusp tip of um, lower left two, cusp tip, 
um, incisal edge of lower left two to the facial aspect of upper left two, what do you think the distance is in millimeters? I'm going to say three. That's exactly what I was going to say. Okay, good. All right, first page, we are already at seven. Okay. All right, let's go ahead and put up that OPG. Yeah, sure. Uh, let's see. Perfect. Okay. This one's going to be a little tricky because I usually use a protractor to do this one, um, you know, ruler. But basically, we're talking about the if there's any angled canines, which there clearly are. I definitely would say upper right three is angled. Um, and they have you kind of bisect it and run a, a line parallel to the occlusal plane. It's, it's all explained. And they and we talk about how tipped is that. So I'm going to put this at about maybe a 60 degree angle between 60 and 40. So we're going to go ahead and give this six points because there is an angled one. Um, oh, and you have to mm -hmm, do it for mm -hmm. both sides and atom. So um, that would be the right. The left one is just a tiny bit angled. So we're going to give that one point. Yep. So that's seven points right there. Okay. Um, so we're already up at 14. So we're getting there. And then there's a couple more. Um, this one, we're going to look at the tip, the cusp tip of both threes. And, and by the way, yeah, so we're just doing uppers. But the cusp tip of both threes, and is it crossing over the twos at all? And actually, we're not on the right side and the left a little bit. So um, we're going to go ahead and give this four. Okay, so we're at 20 now, I think. All right. Mm -hmm. And then do you think that either of these canines, especially the right one, possibly could be pallidly placed or buckly placed? Because it's definitely one or the other because it's tipped. Yeah, so I... I I will. I can just check my notes, uh, probably. But well, did I'm going to say end of a, uh, like a lig ligation and exposure chain and exposure later, or no? Uh, n no, no. He's, he's too too young for that at the moment. But uh, we extracted. Uh, I extracted his uh, deciduous canine as per the orthodontist's mm -hmm. advice in terms of to allow a better path for the eruption of the the permanent canine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so that's that's questionable. So we probably won't get it, but. At the any case, we're a little over 20 points, which basically says consider orthodontic referral. And I probably didn't give justice to the severity of that crossbite in the back, but it definitely would say consider orthodontic referral. So yes, you fell in the, let's do it. And if, and if that was indeed, if you had taken a CBCT and you noticed it was slightly paddled, that would give it five more points. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hey guys, if you want to download that document, The Straight Smile Solutions, My Phase One Smile Index, then either go to link protrusive.co.uk forward slash phase one. That's P H A S E and the number one. So phase one, all one word. Or if you're on the Protrusive Premium and you've got the membership on the app, so iOS or Android, you can download it in your infographics section straight away. Once again, that's protrusive.co.uk forward slash phase one or via the Protrusive app on iOS or Android. This is the same PDF that we were talking about in the episode, and it's really, really useful to go through with your growing patient. So that's either forward slash phase one or from the iOS or Android app. Just search Protrusive on the App Store or iOS Store. So, yeah, fine. So, uh, I mean, so, you did you, the when, right when, thing. When, when, yeah, but I mean, in, in your experience and whatnot, and your what you, what you teach, seeing a, a child like this, do you not feel that there would be some benefit to doing some oh. uh, expansion? 100%. And then we didn't even, like, we don't even have the whole airway thing factored in here. Um, you know, I probably mm -hmm. would have said recommended doing a, a CV or a sleep form. And I have a kid's one. If anybody wants a copy, I'm glad to give it to you. Just screening all different things about snoring and how they breathe. And certainly there was. So he is a mouth breather. Issue. I can tell you that right now. He, he, he is a mouth well, breather. Well, boom. And that's a 100% mm -hmm. do not pass go collect $200. Yes, you get started if you have any airway mm -hmm. issues or mouth breathing because mm -hmm. it's going to make the face grow long, you know. And we didn't even get into yep. the whole face thing or anything like that. So obviously there's a couple of things I notice here that concern me. This is a boy, you said, right? Yes, and I think he's not eight and a half. He's about, about nine and a half, I think. Yeah, okay. So um, he was a slightly it's a boy, delayed, so it's yeah. less urgent for me. I mean, unless I start to see him developing a beard or something like that, and he's six foot tall, <laughs> you know, I'm not as worried about the skeletal issue. On a girl, I'd be flipping. Um, but the boy, I'm not as worried about that. So yes, in theory, you could wait till age 12 because it will still be fixable at age 12. But the airway is something that's critical. Two years of not having an ideal airway and growing in the wrong direction is, is going to get worse. Um, also, I'm worried mm -hmm. about the, um, the ones, you know, the front teeth that, you know, they're basically almost one on top of another, you know, almost negative overjet and you're going to have wear. They're probably going to chip them. This kid is active. This kid's going to go bike riding or, 
you know, play, ride his skateboard. He's going to totally chip it, you know, the upper ones. I know it's going to happen. You yeah, know, so just... he has already, and oh, it has it happened already. We've restored the co- with composite, there's upper centrals. Uh, well, so that's happened go. already. Yeah, so we got that, you know, and like I said, you could theoretically fix it when he's 12 and he, if you hit it right before he grew. But, you know, we've got the wear that's going to get worse. We have the growth that's going to get worse. So, and then that canine, if we don't do something now, the chance of it being impacted is exponentially higher. Um, and, you know, taking out the seeds yep. is great, but that's still not giving that canine enough space to come down. It's not going to come down unless no, you expand. No. So, See, I, I was only yeah. doing what the, the official advice from the orthrontist uh, came mm-hmm. to be. But, yeah, I was a little bit uh, disheartened that the orthodontist mm. had zero interest. And this is purely, in my opinion, just the mm-hmm. way that uh, UK orthodontics is set up in terms of uh, mm-hmm. funding and preference. Uh, and mm-hmm. I'm happy to be shot down on that from any ortho- UK orthodontist listening. But yeah. I don't feel that this, you know, clinically, if you put money mm-hmm. and funding aside, clinically, I think, there was a, I think there was a need for treatment. So the mother was upset. I was upset that this wouldn't be able to be done. Uh, and they mm-hmm. are now considering going the, the private route to, to get it done rather than uh, relying on the mm-hmm. nas- National Health Service which rejected this case basically so so that, that uh, having that kind of um, yeah to having the kind of um, a checklist like you presented is great that we went mm-hmm. through it can be really really helpful uh, and I think in in hindsight if I had a checklist like that to give to the mm-hmm. orthodontist so that they can see my working out they probably wouldn't mm-hmm. have been uh, as flippant as they were towards me uh, in terms of uh, exactly because uh, it would have said you have 20 something be. points you need to have and like I said uh, for me airway is always a yes so you know just should be another score, but that's so hard to, you know, to quantify. So, but what you told mm-hmm. me is definitely a yes. So what ended up happening then? So they're, oh, they're still looking. They're still looking for um, our, Yes, our so um, th- th- he's still my patient. I, I still uh, provide his uh, routine care. Mm-hmm. I extracted the, the canine and a deciduous uh, molar as per the orthodontist advice. Uh, mm-hmm. And so now the next step is, okay, mum, do you want to take next door to the private orthodontist or mm-hmm. do you want to wait until age 12 plus when all the teeth are through to have some uh, mm-hmm. treatment then? So that's kind of where it is at the moment. Yeah, but most likely he's going to need canine exposure surgery, possible premolars out. There's a lot of things. It's just going to be so much more painful and complicated if they wait. I agree. I agree. And that was thought. But um, mm-hmm. Amanda, thanks so much for, for spending some time with us to Thank guide you. us through these things. These things are very scary for GDPs. You know, when you're looking at uh, mm-hmm. treating children, it can uh, be um, outside the comfort zone for a lot of GDPs. But I think listening today, the, the most important thing we got from today was just knowing which diagnoses would, would benefit from phase one and, and being able to diagnose and be aware and have that conversation. Now, some dentists may feel that they can, hey, I, you know, maybe I can help my patients out and that's where they can get further training. I know you do lots of training and stuff, so we'll put the link so they can reach out to you. Make sure you download sure. Uh, the, the download, which I'll put uh, the mm-hmm. link so you can actually get that PDF. So next time you're referring, if you're referring or treating, so whether you're justifying to yourself, hey, am I right in thinking that this patient may benefit from inceptive orthodontics and you can go through mm-hmm. a checklist? But even if you're referring, for your peace of mind, it's, it's good to show the working out to the orthodontist you're referring to potentially to show them your thought process and, and how you followed yeah. something logical in terms of diagnoses. So I think that uh, handout will have incredible value for, the, for those listening yeah. and watching. Please tell us uh, uh, some other channels that we can reach out to you, Amanda. Sure, no problem. My website is straightsmilesolutions.com. So straight smile solutions, plural. And you can Google it, it'll pop up. And on my channel, I also have that access or that link to that 6,500 ortho educational videos that are totally free. You might occasionally see a Google pop-up ad, basically pays for my Starbucks occasionally, but that's about it. But um, there's just, I, my goal, like I told you guys, is to help to make kids happier and healthier and have to pull out less teeth, you know? and prevent surgery. So if I can give away information, then I think I've done a good thing in life. So you guys, it's out there. It's free. Enjoy it. Amazing. Thank you so much, Amanda. It's been, it's been great Thank to have you as, as a yes. really passionate guest and, and someone who's empowering to dentists, yes. who's going to help us treat children at the right time so they get better care and better growth, better airways, uh, and less need, hopefully, for phase two and extraction. So thank you so much. You got it. Aloha, guys. Well, there we have it, guys. That was Dr. Amanda Wilson. She's so energetic and enthusiastic about the development of these young people and how with the relevant phase one, you could really help these patients avoid a phase two or 
more uh, less complicated phase two. Now, wherever you are in the world, remember that the system that you're in, it can be difficult to implement these things and also depends on medical legally where you stand in being able to implement phase one therapy. Do you have the right training and mentorship behind you? But I think we can all appreciate that all the things that Dr. Amanda Wilson talked about, these are things that we should be looking out for in growing children. And it makes sense when we're looking at the development, the facial and uh, occlusal development of our young growing patients that we look out for these things and refer when appropriate. So I hope you found that episode useful and I'll join you at the same time, same place next week.